Internal gravity waves are important in a number of different geophysical contexts, and their existence is dependent on the existence of something known as a stable density stratification. Now, a stable density stratification is exactly what it sounds like. It's if you have different density fluids, you've got the most dense fluid at the bottom and the least dense at the top. Um, and this kind of makes sense. This is a stable situation. If you had more dense fluid on the top, it would sink and it would be unstable. Um, so we, we're basically making the assumption that d rho by dz is less than zero. Okay, so provided this exists, can we find wave-like solutions if we, say, move something in the fluid and work out what the dispersion relation for those waves is and see what effect the density stratification has on them? So we're going to find a base state and we're going to perturb that base state with small perturbations and look at the form of those perturbations. And the base state is going to be at rest and we're going to denote all of the base state quantities with subscript zeros. So u naught is zero. Let's see what the other base state quantities, the density and the pressure, and uh, are in this case. We'll label these three equations, one, two, and three. Equation one is just encoding incompressibility of the fluid. Equation two is our familiar Euler equation. And equation three is mass conservation. Now, of course, we mass conservation in this case is not encoded simply by the divergence being zero, because we have this density stratification. Okay, so this equation one is just straight away satisfied by this base state so let's move on to equation two the left hand side of equation two is zero in this case but the right hand side just gives me minus grad p naught minus rho naught g z hat equals zero and that implies that we can write the base state pressure is just going to be some integral of minus g times the integral of rho naught of z with respect to z. Uh, maybe we'll make that dummy variable, but that's our expression for the base state pressure. And equation 3 tells us basically that d rho naught by dt is equal to 0. And that implies that rho naught is just a function of vertical position alone, which is what you expect because you want a steady base state, and if the base state density distribution depended on time, it would no longer be steady. Okay, so now let's look at the linearized perturbation equations. We're going to take the velocity field to be u naught plus u tilde. We're going to take our pressure field to be p naught plus p tilde. And we're going to take our density field to be rho naught plus rho tilde. And all of these tilde quantities are small, but they're functions of space. And so we ignore any products of them when seeking linear perturbation equations. So equation one tells us that the divergence of u tilde is zero. OK, this is what we'd expect because the divergence of u naught is zero and the divergence of u together has to be zero. Two gives us, well, we have a contribution at leading order from rho naught times du tilde by dt. There's no rho tilde times du naught by dt. This term drops out to be zero because, or this second nonlinear term drops out to be zero because we're just working in linearized equations here. So this is equal to minus grad p tilde um, plus rho tilde, or minus, sorry, minus rho tilde g z hat. That's all the first order terms on the right hand side of that equation. And equation three just gives us that d rho tilde by dt plus um, u tilde dot grad rho naught is equal to zero. Uh, we have no u naught dot grad rho tilde again because u naught is zero. But we know that grad, sorry, this is a bit of a mess. We know that grad p naught or rho naught is just zero, zero d rho naught by dz because rho naught only depends on the vertical direction. So actually, we can write this in an even simpler form as d rho tilde by dt plus w tilde d rho naught by dz equals zero, uh, where u tilde 
it's just going to be u tilde v tilde w tilde like normal okay so these are our three linearized perturbation equations they will appear on the next slide where we go to calculate the form of these perturbation quantities a little bit more now we only want to work in one of these variables and we probably want that to be the velocity really so actually we want to eliminate these or can we eliminate the perturbation pressure and the perturbation density well in order to do so we have to make some assumptions we've already talked about this assumption on the form of u tilde but we're going to make an assumption called the Boussinesque approximation and the Boussinesque approximation basically says Okay, our equations feature densities and density gradients from the base state, but we'll assume that both rho naught and d rho naught by dz when they appear are constant. Now, obviously, that's not immediately consistent. If rho naught were a constant, d rho naught by dz would be zero. But this is the assumption that we make because the wavelength of the waves we're seeking is much, much smaller than the lengths over which rho naught varies. So if we had a very small tank with very big waves, for example, these approximations wouldn't be valid anymore. But for the vast amount of geophysical flows, we make the Boussinesque approximation. So the first thing we want to eliminate is P tilde. And that's relatively easy because to eliminate a gradient, we know we can just take the curl. So numbering these equations, one, two, and three, we'll just take the curl of equation two. Now, the curl of this first term, remember, we're treating P rho naught to be a constant here, so we can pull it outside of the curl. We have rho naught d by dt, the curl of u tilde, is equal to, well, the curl of a gradient is zero, so we're just left with minus g curl of rho tilde z hat. Okay. It turns out we can rewrite this here uh, if you go and look at uh, what the equation comes out to be. This is exactly the same as g um, z hat uh, crossed with d, uh, well, it's not, not d by dt, uh, crossed with um, grad rho tilde. Sorry, it just took me a little while to work that one out, but that is what that's equal to if you just look at the components. Okay, so we now want to get rid of this grad rho tilde. How can we do that? Well, equation three is quite handy. So let's now take d by dt of this again. So there's already a time derivative in it, but we'll do it again. So we get rho naught d2 by dt squared of the curl of u tilde is equal to g z hat cross grad d rho tilde by dt. But we know what d rho tilde by dt is from this equation here. So we're left with rho naught um, times d2 by dt squared, the curl of u tilde, is equal to g z hat crossed with minus the gradient of omega or w tilde d rho naught by dz okay remember we're treating d rho naught by dz to be a constant so we can pull this out and we're just left therefore with minus g d rho naught by dz uh, time z hat cross grad w tilde okay so this is our equation and this is an equation in u tilde. Remember, w tilde is just one of the components of u tilde. Okay, so we can now take the curl again. Um, we'll probably go on to a different slide for this. So this is what we got to on the last slide. We'll take the curl again. So take the curl of this equation, and that gives us rho naught d2 by dt squared curl of curl of u tilde. Remember, we've taken rho naught outside the curl because we're still treating it as a constant, is equal to minus g d rho naught by dz curl of z crossed with grad w tilde. Okay, 
we'll use some identities here. So we have an identity for the curl of the curl. And we get rho naught d2 by dt squared grad of div u tilde minus del squared u tilde is equal to minus g d rho naught by dz times the curl of z cross omega uh, tilde is just going to be equal to this expression here. So we get minus, w, sorry, I keep calling it omega, I mean w, uh, where these subscripts represent differentiation. So this is d2w by dx dz. Uh, and this here is d2w by dy dz. And then this here is d2w by dx squared plus d2w by dy squared. Okay, this here is zero by the incompressibility of u tilde. And so we're left with an equation now that still looks relatively messy. But let's just take the z hat component of the equation. And the z hat component of the equation, therefore, is just minus rho naught d2 by dt squared grad squared w tilde is equal to minus g d rho naught by dz times basically just uh, the, the horizontal Laplacian d2 w tilde by dx squared plus d2 w tilde by dy squared. Okay, right. So we can now rewrite this equation. Um, let's just maybe move on to a new slide. We can rewrite it in this form here, where this n is called the Brunt um, Vesela frequency. Uh, I'm never sure how to pronounce this. There's far too many umlauts in Vesela for me to know how to pronounce it. But And this here is positive. Well, so n squared is positive because remember, d rho naught by dz is less than zero. So when we write it in this form, we can actually find wave-like solutions. And the way we find wave-like solutions is we postulate that omega tilde is proportional to e to the i k dot x minus um, omega t. Now, when we do this, uh, this, this omega here is equal to the, oh, sorry, i omega t. This is the angular frequency of the wave. And this thing here, k, is the wave vector. So this is a bit like the wave number, but in three dimensions. And this wave vector, k, has components k, l, m, by convention. If you plug a w tilde of this form into this equation here, we're left with minus omega squared plus n squared k squared plus l squared. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, I have missed something out here. This equation is incorrect. There should be a grad squared here. Um, if we just go back to the previous slide, you see here we have d2 by dt squared times grad squared. So that's just missing from the equation here. So we have minus omega squared times minus l squared minus k squared minus m squared plus n squared times... Um, uh, so times, there's a problem here, um, coming from the, oh, there, uh, coming from uh, the minus sign. But if we if we follow this through, uh, we end up with k squared plus l squared is equal to zero, and that gives us this dispersion relation here, that the square of the um, angular frequency is equal to this brunt vesela frequency times just the x and y wave vector components squared all over the modulus of the wave vector as a whole. Um, and so we can actually identify this with a sine squared theta because this angle here is theta. This is just uh, the direction, the angle between z hat, i.e. the vertical direction, the direction in which there is a density stratification and the wave vector. So what does this actually mean? Uh, we've found a wave-like solution. Uh, how can we talk about this in the language of waves? Okay, there are two velocities uh, when we're considering waves. We have the phase velocity. Um, uh, so the phase velocity we'll call Cp, which is the phase velocity. 
and this here is vector and it's just going to be omega over k or so uh, in the direction k hat where, where k here is just the modulus of the wave vector so this is the speed at which you see the crests of the wave propagating um, the group velocity cg is an entirely different thing altogether and this here is d omega by dk and this is the speed so this the, the phase velocity is crest propagation velocity and the group velocity is the energy propagation velocity uh, or if you have a wave packet it's the velocity at which that wave packet propagates so the group velocity is is energy propagation velocity So what does this actually mean in practice? Well, here is an especially poor image of a wave source here that's oscillating up and down in a tank with a stable density stratification. And you might be inclined to look at this and go, ah, and waves are radiating out like this. Um, and that's true in the sense of group velocity. The energy is radiating out like this, but the crests, the ripples, actually you see move like this. So you see these long waves that are moving basically perpendicular to the um, to the group velocity of these packets here, and the ripples come out uh, moving perpendicular to the radial directions. So it seems a bit counterintuitive, actually. Um, if you get a chance to see this experiment in the lab during any lab demos this year, I would grab onto that chance because it's uh, it's a really it's striking when you see this result. Um, and I'm sorry that it was a relatively involved derivation to get here, uh, and I made a few mistakes along the way, but I hope that has cleared a few things up on internal gravity waves. And in case it hasn't, which is entirely possible, uh, there's a whole chapter in Aitchison's book about them, or a whole section of a chapter, and there's also a discussion of internal gravity waves on the Part 2 Waves notes. Uh, Stephen Cowley's got a set of Part 2 Waves notes. You'll probably find some others online. But here's a link to some that might be helpful. But if you've got any questions, as with everything else, bring them along to the in-person uh, session or drop me an email.